So today, I'm going to welcome you to the biology of bread making. Why bread making as a lecture? Uh, to me, this whole time that COVID has presented us with at home has led to us kind of having to be a bit creative with what we do with our time. We get more time with our families, we get more time with being able to catch up on reading, gardening. Some of us, a large number of us, given the shortage of flour and yeast that happened throughout the summer, took up baking and I was one of those culprits. And I really think it really was something that helped me get through, uh, especially the lockdown period and even now going forward, just kind of having the habit of taking time and making some bread every week. So today we're gonna go through that process. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction into the components that go into bread and I'll walk you through step by step my recipe uh, uh, of, my, of my recipe. It's a no need artisanal style bread and uh, specifically it's going to require minimal work, minimal ingredients and hopefully you end up with a product that will be tasty and yummy. Um, so thank you once again for joining me and uh, we'll get started. So what are the basic components of the lecture? Like I said, essential ingredients, what goes into bread? the four key ingredients that go into bread is what makes it delicious and we're going to highlight what these are we're going to talk about what each of the ingredients do what are they doing as the bread is being folded together what are they doing as the bread is actually rising or proofing and then what's the outcome and why does your bread look the way that it does so to start let's think about the main ingredients you might need for delicious bread it's not a complicated process. People have been making bread for ages and arguably the best bread makers in the world will say you need flour. Like flour is the key ingredient, right? Flour is the number one ingredient in all bread. Second, you need water. It's flour in itself would not make bread. It would just make clumpy bits of flour that would be hard to consume. So hydrate that flour to be able to get that flour to start working. And we'll talk about that work in a bit you need water. Then we need kind of the workhorse, the powerhouse that's actually functioning to make bread what it is. And that is yeast. Microbial organisms that are fascinating. Uh, I'm going to highlight kind of how they do what they do today uh, to make bread as delicious and as awesome as it is. And then finally a little bit of flavoring because we always like a little bit of flavoring. Um, salt. It's an option for people that are on a no salt diet. You really could get away with just flour, water and yeast but you can add minimal amounts of salt if you're on a reduced salt diet or if you're just okay with having salt, a moderate amount. And I'll, I'll just show you kind of in my recipe what really works and then it really be, it's what you do with the bread after the fact that makes it so much better, right? Like add some butter, add some cheese, add whatever and bread just goes on in multiple levels of elevation of deliciousness post baking. Okay, so let's talk about these components. Flour main ingredient in bread like I said it has such a crucial role in bread because it contains starches specifically starches that get broken down into sugars and the sugars are super key because the sugars are going to be used by something that makes the bread rise and we'll talk about that very soon flour also has proteins and specifically two main types of proteins that combine together to make what we know glutens in bread and they're essential in the bread making process to provide the actual bread with structure being able to provide the bread with cohesiveness being able to provide the bread with elasticity in the actual um, dough forming process and even in the rising phase then we have water water is going to be able to strengthen that bread structure specifically you end up having the hydrogen bonds forming between these gluten proteins and water in itself will help strengthen hydrogen bonds, help with that structure, um, uh, structure of the bread, help with the elasticity of the bread, and more importantly, give the life to the bread as a whole. And what do I mean life? Because when water is combined with flour and yeast, the yeast get activated. So literally the bread comes to life. So not only are we looking at hydrating that flour, but also activating that yeast with that hydration. Yeast. 
Why is yeast so awesome? As a biologist, I mean, <laughs> yeast are phenomenal organisms. They're small eukaryotes belonging to the fungi kingdom, and they're found everywhere. They can be found outdoors, they're found in grapes, um, they're found all over your garden, on flowers, they're found on our bodies, in our bodies. They're just like this really profuse organism that's everywhere. What's cool is we can actually use them as the star of our bread making show. Like I'm your lecturer today, I'm your host today on this show, but truly the star of the show sits in this little bowl that I've got beside me. And we'll talk more about this little, these millions and billions of microbial organisms I've got here beside me. So what's so special about these? These yeast that we're gonna be using in bread and that generally are referred to as baker's yeast are a type of yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They're like the leavening agent that gives bread its leavening capacity. So when they get activated with water, they're gonna be able to allow for the activation of their own cellular processes and allow for the bread to get fluffy. And we'll talk about why very soon. Um, if we're looking at Saccharomyces a little bit closer, I want you to acknowledge how phenomenal these organisms are. They're single-celled, they have a true nucleus, so they're eukaryotic, and they have this really cool ability to reproduce by budding. So we often in biology call them budding yeast because when they're reproducing themselves, they literally produce a daughter cell from the mother cell and bud off as two daughter cells during their replication cycle. How do they do this? They've got all the machinery that they need. Really, all they actually further require is sugar and a really moist environment. So the environment in a vat of bread that's being made is a perfect environment. There's gonna be sugars from the flour, there's gonna be moisture from the water, and you're gonna have the best case scenario for these yeasts to thrive. So we can think about different forms of yeast. I've got here today, and I'll zoom in on the camera, uh, a type of instant or a quick rise yeast. There's also, oh, I just got yeast totally all over my laptop. <laughs> That's the problems with quarantine cooking, right? Yeast everywhere. Um, so I have instant dry yeast, as I mentioned here on the left side. We also have active dry yeast that basically is another type of powdered form of yeast that you can buy. Um, and there's very little difference, but some slight difference between the two types of yeast varieties that you can just walk into your local grocery store and pull off the shelf. What's the difference between the two? Active dry yeast was the original type of dry yeast that was developed. It was like World War II. Um, there was a real challenge with being able to make bread on the front lines for military personnel. So researchers came up with the idea at one of the biggest yeast um, producing companies that I won't name because this isn't like a marketing plug, but one of the biggest yeast producing companies in the world came up with the idea of producing yeast in a dry form, in a dehydrated form that could be used very quickly on the front lines to be able to help make bread quite readily for soldiers that were actually in the uh, front lines at the World War II war fronts. It is a type of yeast, active dry yeast, that requires hydration generally in advance. So this is the type of yeast that you would have to put in some warm water, add a little bit of sugar, and let it sit till it actually activates before you add it into everything that you're actually baking. Instant dry yeast, which is what I'm using today for the sake of uh, speed and timeliness, is an actual more refined version of the active dry yeast that has smaller particle sizes, less bulk around all the tiny microbial organisms, and allows for faster permeation of the yeast by the water, faster activation, and getting those instant dry yeast rapidly causing the rising of the bread to occur, okay? You can also buy fresh yeast. Um, a lot of bakers, uh, a lot of artisanal bake shops have chunks of yeast that are like blocks. Um, those are the purest forms of yeast. Um, you can actually grow your own yeast culture. I know during this whole lockdown, when everyone was kind of like into baking and hoard buying yeast, <laughs> 
And there was a point where I actually had to make my own yeast culture, and that's your sourdough starter. So that's quite easy. You just take a bit of flour, some water, you babysit it for a couple of days, you keep feeding it with more flour and water, and what you're doing is you're producing yeast and activating yeast that's naturally found in flour, in the air in your home, in that actual starter. So there's multiple ways to do it, but like I said, um, I tend to stick with instant dry yeast uh, or active dry yeast because it is quite easy to use. Finally, salt. Like I said, salt can be used as an additive to bread to be able to provide some flavor. Salt's actually really good in bread, not in an abundant amount, but in a small, moderate amount to be able to control how much the yeast grows. So now think back in basic principles of osmosis. If you're looking at water and salt, salt is very hygroscopic, meaning it draws water to itself. So if you add salt into your actual bowl when you're making your bread, it's gonna draw water to itself. This controls how much yeast is getting hydrated. And in particular, through osmosis, how much yeast is provided or how much water is provided to the yeast itself. So it's gonna be able to help control the yeast reproduction, control the activation of the yeast to break down sugars and be able to use those sugars during their processes. And we'll talk about what those processes are as we go on in the lecture. Finally, salt contributes to crust coloration. So basically, as the salt is being able to draw water to it, yeast are consuming less sugar in the actual dough mixture and that sugar gets to sit on the bread more. So effectively what you've done is you've got sugar ready to be caramelized or sugar ready to be slightly burned through what we call a Maillard reaction. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So really salt does contribute as well to crust coloration when bread, making bread. All right, one final thing. I know a lot of people are like, I make my bread, I pop it on a pizza stone, or I just put it in a loaf of bread, or a loaf, of, a, a, a loaf tin for bread, and effectively that does it for me. I wanna be able to provide a small tip that really was lent to us by a lot of um, more traditional French bakers. Specifically, the ability to have steam in the oven helps you with crisping the crust of your bread, helps you with getting that harder shell of a crust on your bread. We don't have in our conventional ovens at home the capacity to have steam injected, unless you are a professional baker, and in that case I envy you. <laughs> but given that we don't have the capacity to inject steam into our oven, people have gotten creative over the years. Many people put a uh, baking dish or a baking pan in the oven, set it up in the oven in advance, and let it sit dry and just as they add their bread, even without any vessel around the bread, even if it's on a pizza stone, they carefully add some water and poof, you have instant steam as that colder water hits that really, really hot dry tin. Another shortcut around this is creating a chamber. A chamber where as the actual biological processes are to being Take on, taken on by the yeast in the dough, that that water that's produced, the moisture that's produced by the yeast is captured by the actual vessel and retains steam around the bread. This is where something like a closed chamber really helps. Not only does it help, but it also helps to uh, maintain steam. It also helps to actual, um, actually retain a stable temperature environment, barring away any temperature fluctuations that your oven may have. So overall, what do you get? You get a more moist dough and ultimately that nice crispy crust that we all really enjoy kind of chunking down on and biting down on on a slice of bread or just a piece of a loaf of bread. And ultimately you also get maximal volume produced. What do I use? I'm gonna show you, I use a Dutch oven. I'm also gonna show you another device that I have. It's like a traditional clay pot from um, our family that's been passed down. So really, it's um, just a closed chamber will do, any type of closed vessel that's oven proof and oven safe at higher temperatures. Okay, 
So without further ado, I've described to you what goes into bread, what their essential roles are. This would be a horrible lecture if I didn't actually share with you the actual recipe for my bread. It would be horrible, right? Like I'd just be like, all right, goodbye, walk away, good luck with your bread making activities. However, we're gonna do it together. If you're not able to actually get um, ingredients right now, it's all right, you can do this after the fact when the video is released. I'm gonna get started by stopping my screen sharing and focusing here on my island. And what I'm gonna do is what every good scientist does. A scientist prepares in advance and gets their workspace ready. So what do I have? I have essential tools. These would be the equivalent of my dissecting instruments. And specifically, I'm gonna need a measuring cup with one cup capacity. I'm going to need a big spoon, a big ladle. Truly, you can use anything. This is just a stir. It's a no need bread recipe. So really, I just want to be able to combine the ingredients and then let them sit. And I'm going to have a teaspoon because my bread recipe is super easy and who's got time for complicated recipes nowadays? So I try to keep it pretty simple. So these are bare essentials. I've also got my kitchen scissors. You're like, why are you doing this? Is this arts and crafts time? Totally not. Many people use what's called a lom, which is a way to be able to get the nice cuts into your bread. You don't need a lom. You need something that cuts. I use my kitchen scissors. It's all that's really necessary, okay? So basically I got my kitchen scissors and I've got some cloths just in case I kind of make a mess, which I tend to do in the kitchen. And then ultimately I've got my key ingredients. And you don't have to stage it like this. Like, let's be real. I staged it for you because I'm providing you with an advanced lecture, but you can be as organized as this, or you can say, I'm going to take it from the bag as I go. Truly, I take everything from the bag as I go. Don't feel like you have to have preparatory vessels or anything like that. You just actually have to have the ingredients. Okay. So here is my flour. Okay. This is all-purpose flour. It's unbleached. I pre-sifted it. Nothing special about it, just some flour. I've got an extra bit of flour. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do with it later. I'm gonna save it for a couple minutes from now. I've got, oh, I've got a hair in my salt. Oh, that's not good. No longer have a hair in my salt. That's okay. I now have salt with no hair. I actually have salt. Here we go. All right. This will not be on the exam, I promise. And here we go, we have yeast, the star of my show, Saccharomyces cerevisiae in all its splendid glory. Yes, go yeast. And finally, one really nice thing that I add into my type of bread is a little bit of whole wheat flour. And I like adding whole wheat flour because it gives me a little bit more of a greeny flavor. Don't get me wrong, all purpose white flour is delicious, but I really like a little bit of that kind of nuttier taste that's given to me by whole wheat flour. It's got the wheat germ, it's got the bran. My mom will say it's also better for me, but that's okay, this is my compromise. Three cups of white flour, four tablespoons of whole wheat. My mom will be happy. All right, so those are my main ingredients. What am I missing? Who can guess? Who can pop that into the chat? Got some main dry ingredients. Water, yeah, there you go. So you've got some water. So that's where my measuring cup is gonna come into play as well. I use water from my tap. Some people are like, oh, it's better to use, you know, mineral water. It's better to use filtered water. I live in Mississauga. Mississauga water has done well. It doesn't mean you need to drive to Mississauga to get Mississauga water. You can use tap water from your actual home. The important thing is that it's warm water. My tap water kind of runs like the fires of Mordor, so I kind of am a little bit careful um, to be able to try to be cautious about how hot that water gets. Um, but I do quite run it a little bit warm, um, more on the hot side. Like it's not like a burning feeling, but just like a nice warm uh, water, okay? All right, so I've got my mixing bowl as well. It doesn't need to be glass. Again, this is just because I wanted to make you guys be able to see everything that's being added into the mixture. But the most important thing is it fits your uh, ingredients and it has room to allow rising to occur, okay? So let's get everything going. What's the first thing I do? These are my three cups of flour and I'm literally, it's pre-sifted, 
Um, some of you might be like, oh, what did you use to pre-sift? Nothing glorious. Uh, let me give you an example. Here is the big sifter that I use. It's a little bit of a ginormous sifter. If you don't have a sifter this big, don't feel disappointed. You can use a sifter as small as the one that you use to actually like sift out and drain and prevent your tea leaves from going into your teacup. It could be as small as you want, okay? So the important thing is you have everything ready because then you're gonna be a prepared chef. Whether it's from a bag, it's fine. Whether it's pre-prepared in bowls and makes you feel special, go for it, because it's always good to feel special, okay? So here we go. We end up having my all-purpose flour combined into my bowl, pre-sifted, get the little residue out. All right. I'm then gonna add my whole wheat flour. So here's my whole wheat flour. Literally, it's four heaping tablespoons because I like that nutty flavor. And I'm gonna dump it in. Then, I don't wanna add all this yeast. If you add too much yeast, your bread's gonna be horrible. It's gonna rise really fast. It's gonna have the inability to um, do anything but make your bread taste sour and not have very much structure. How much do we need? Here is my little one teaspoon measuring spoon. I'm gonna take for all this flour, three quarters of a teaspoon of my Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Why did I say that? Because I'm a scientist. I'm not just gonna call it yeast. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae in my actual teaspoon, and you can see it is three quarters of a teaspoon. And I'm gonna put it on one side of my bowl. I don't want my Saccharomyces cerevisiae to be necessarily too close to my actual salt. So I'm putting it right here. I'm gonna add a little bit more because I realized I was a bit cheap on that. So I'm gonna add a bit more. Baking is quite forgiving when you're baking bread. Not necessarily when you're making like some sort of cake, it's not as forgiving. You add a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, it's okay. You can compensate and I'll show you what I mean, okay? Yeah, you agree, I totally agree with you. And then finally, salt. I like putting one teaspoon of salt because it's gonna give everything that I need to the bread. It's gonna be able to control my yeast growth. It's going to be able to allow for stability in the structure of the bread. It's going to be able to add flavor to my bread. So to me and my family, we usually like, it's not a heaping teaspoon, it's a little short of a leveled teaspoon, okay? So here we go. There's my leveled teaspoon, and I'm gonna put it on the opposite side. So there's my yeast, there is my salt. All right, now what? I need my water, so I'm gonna go to my sink. I'm gonna run the water in advance, all the way on hot, just so it's actually warming up. Wipe my hands down. There's no need to wear gloves in the kitchen, which is great. I'm going to check my water just to see how it is. Not warm enough. We'll wait for a bit. Get that Mississauga water. That's right. Yes, I do commute to Hamilton. I love the campus. Um, it's just we live here in, uh, in Mississauga. And we live in a nice area. It's a conservation area. We've been here for a long time. Family's nearby. So it just feels right to hang out here, you know, just to be able to be with family, and at the same time, it's not a bad commute to work. I drive against traffic, which is kind of pretty good in that respect. All right, so the steam's going in my sink, because like I said, my water, my hot water, runs like the fire and the mortar around here. You don't run or use a kettle. The dangers of using boiling water is you can destroy Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, or any yeast. So you don't want to kill your yeast, you want to gently wake them up which is where some nice, warm, warmish to hot water is gonna do well, okay? So I'm gonna take how many cups of water? This is what you don't do in a lab. Walk across the lab with your ingredients. But I'm gonna take one cup. I'm gonna take a second cup. Walk it across my kitchen lab space. Never do that in lab, when you're back in labs. And then I'm going to take a bit more water and just leave it here. Let it sit here with me. Alright, that'll do. What do we have in my bowl right now? It's a mushy mess, but that's okay. It's going to look a lot better and it'll taste a lot better in my belly. So, 
basically I'm going to start combining and this is where my big soup spoon is coming in handy. This is a type of dough that you want it to be a little bit more moist. You want it to be not really a dry dough. You're not kneading it. You're not going to have to pound the life out of it and your arms. You're actually just going to have to mix the ingredients until they're sticky. Okay? So it looks a little bit dry. And that's why I err on the side of caution. I only add two full cups of water at the onset. Then I combine the ingredients a little bit and I see how it looks. When it gets to this crumbly kind of estate, I start adding like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of water at a time by eye. Like this is a forgiving art. So here we go, a little bit here, a little bit there. And don't worry if you're like, oh no, I added too much and now it's like a soppy mess. Just grab some flour and be like, pa, pa, pa. You've got more flour, don't worry. You can rescue this bread, okay? So here we go. It's coming together a little better. I was probably cheap on that extra tablespoon, so I'm gonna add a little bit more. I want it to be just nice and sticky, this dough. Oh, there we go, that sounds a lot better. And it's sat like you can hear it sounding like it's sticking to the sides of your bowl a lot better. This is a no knead dough recipe. You need to get it combined and then the moisture the yeast will take the wheel and make this dough what you need it to be before it goes into the oven. All right, so here we go. We end up having a nice sticky consistency. So if your spoon, you raise it and lower it, and you've got this nice sticky consistency, way to go. This is all you needed to do. You've combined the ingredients, you've gotten it to a nice sticky type of an elastic consistency. I'm going to use my teaspoon to just scrape the excess off. All the bread that's used is used. There's no waste. And there you go. That's literally all you need to do to combine your ingredients and basically get it ready to be able to start proofing or rising. So do I want it to just sit like this? I don't want it to sit like this. I want it to be in a draftless environment. I want it to have pretty stable temperature. Some people use cloth, some people use linen. I use good old plastic wrap because I can cover it and let it walk away or walk away and have it in a really nice high moisture environment. And I know as biologists, we're like, oh, but the plastic wrap isn't good. I always make sure that I recycle my plastic and put it into my recycling waste. So it's really important. We use minimal plastic in our home, but I find that the moisture just keeps itself so much better under a thin sheet of plastic, okay? All right, so now my bread is covered. It's ready to proof. How long does this happen for? I like to have the bread proofing for a minimum of three hours. So basically what's gonna happen during this time is the bread's gonna rise, we're gonna talk about why that happens, but it gives it a good period of time and I keep it in an area that's generally warmer than anywhere else in my kitchen. If I'm not baking, I put it on my stove top. But because I'm baking and I have a cheap oven, like let's be real, my oven is just not, it's not a high-end thing, like this isn't a cooking show, but it does its job. I make sure that when I end up putting it on the oven, it's not a hot oven. If it is a hot oven, I'll just put it on the counter beside the hot oven and it'll be happy rising in this warmish area, okay? So my oven's on because this is a condensed version of the lecture um, and I've got it at 450. Um, 450 because that's the temperature that you wanna bake this type of artisanal bread at higher temperature, higher pressure, higher steam that builds up in my chamber that I'm gonna be using, okay? Now, if we're looking at what we wanna wait for in these three hours, I keep an eye on the bread. I keep an eye on whether it's rising. If I notice after an hour that it's not rising, it could be that my yeast has died and I've just kind of like let it sit for too long in its container when I bought it, or I just maybe killed it with the hot water. So I'll always come back after an hour to double check, double check that it is rising. That's telling me that the yeast are active and it's actually doing its job, okay? All right, so now 
we're going to talk about proofing. Let's think about what's happening during this proofing stage. This is the rising phase. Now, sometimes people will have for different bread recipes, um, a strategy to be able to proof their bread multiple times or let the bread rise a couple of times and fall and knead it out, knead it out, knead it out. We don't need to excessively knead this bread at all beyond what we just did by combining the ingredients because it is a moisture bread. That's gonna give your proteins in your bread space to start interconnecting, making a stronger structure, have elasticity, and give the yeast the ability to blow up this elastic bread fiber and protein mesh network into these nice balloons and pockets of um, carbon dioxide that are building up within the actual bread. So all we need to do is give it one good proof and then we're gonna prepare the bread for the oven. So what happens during proofing? Proofing is basically when your Saccharomyces cerevisiae is doing its job. So like I said, it is a microbial organism that thrives in an environment with high moisture and sugars. Check. Our actual bowl has sugars in the flour. The flour also has, um, to break down the complex carbohydrates, the starches, amylase, a type of protein in the flour that when water is added, helps to break down that starch so the actual Saccharomyces can start using the sugars. And ultimately, the moisture is the water that we provided, okay? So what's happened once we actually take this yeast and hydrated it? So I borrowed this video um, from a, uh, a fellow on YouTube showing you kind of like a little mini, mini experiment you can do in your kitchen. Just taking a small dish and activate your yeast and immediately what you'll see is you'll see that bubbles start to form after a certain period of time and that's the yeast getting activated. Let's say we were to take this sample to a lab. We can take a sample of these activated yeast and look at them under the microscope. So here we have a 40 times magnification and what we can see is this hydrated yeast sample under the microscope at 40 times magnification, at 100 times magnification, every single dot that you see is an individual Saccharomyces cerevisiae cell. You see clumps of them here, you see individual ones. We're gonna, this fellow, in, increase the magnification to 150 fold. We're still not seeing the surface of these cells. We're still not seeing very much detail of these cells but we can keep increasing the magnification till eventually we can identify, oh yeah, this is budding yeast. The Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast that buds during reproduction of itself. So here we have 400 times magnification and what we can see as time lapses and this individual keeps increasing the magnification is more detail on these cells and some that are budding. Look at this one here in the middle, it's budding and we see some here that are budding. This little fella here is budding. And we're gonna see at even higher magnification, a really good example of some budding yeast that are just completing their replication. This really is kind of a really nice example of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And if you look closely enough, you can actually see the nuclear area where the nucleus sits in these very small, uh, eukaryotic organisms at 1500 times magnification. So it's quite remarkable. So we are dealing with live organisms in our bread. These are microbial organisms that have the ability to bud and reproduce and they need the energy to be able to do so and do so efficiently. So how do they do that? Well, when it comes to budding yeast, just like other organisms, when it comes to the main source of energy all our cells use for all important processes or most important processes, it's in the form of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So for yeast to be able to carry out these processes and what happens when they're activated by water to carry out these processes is they can basically take sugar from their environment, sugar in the bread, use it through a process called alcoholic fermentation so they basically produce alcohol by the end, ethanol. And ultimately, they then have the capacity to, while they're producing the alcohol and carbon dioxide as waste, during this process, 
make small amounts of ATP in an anaerobic or oxygen deprived environment. So this is really cool. Like this is all happening as I'm sitting here and my bowl of proofing uh, dough is just sitting on the counter. So it's quite remarkable to think about, right? Like the beauty of biology surrounds us, literally in this case. So really, it's really important for yeast to consume sugars and make ATP. We take advantage of this to make our bread, right? Look how like parasitic we are, right? Oh, come on yeast, welcome into my home. I'm gonna keep you in my shelf and then I'm gonna use you and then use your byproducts to eat you <laughs> effectively. But it's really cool because it's the carbon dioxide that yeast produce that causes the proofing or causes the leavening of our actual uh, bread in the proofing stage. It is a byproduct of their metabolism of sugar. It's a byproduct of them making ATP. CO2 is basically their waste during this whole energy cascade. But we take advantage of it, pop it into some flour, water, and uh, salt, and we get our bread. So it's quite phenomenal. Alcohol is also a product. There are some um, yeast like Saccharomyces cerevisiae that uh, produce uh, alcohol and it can be used for alcohol fermentation to make different types of um, alcoholic drinks. Um, so for example, ale, uh, beer is made using uh, partly Saccharomyces cerevisiae as well, except there um, the brewers are taking advantage of the alcohol and keep the alcohol in the beverages. All right, we need to now Think about following the three hour time lapse. Ding, three hours have passed. We need to get bread into the oven. So I'm gonna show you what I would do with a bread that's pretty much finished its proofing or rising stage and what I would then do to get it into the oven um, for baking. So this morning, um, I actually prepared something in advance because why not? And what we see here is another bowl and look at this beauty this um, leavening or rising bread is or dough it's not bread yet is pretty much ready to just explode from this container it started at about mm, here uh, and it's spent the last three hours uh, so I actually didn't do it this morning I did it like at noon but it spent the last three hours uh, rising up to where it is now so effectively, I want to be able to get it ready and touch it minimally, like not break up the bubbles. If I take off the wrapping, what you'll see is you'll see the air pockets. Well, it's not really air, the carbon dioxide pockets that built up as we actually had the Saccharomyces cerevisiae carrying out the alcoholic fermentation. So I'm just going to take off this plastic. If you get a little bit of dough on the plastic, don't worry, you can just pull it down, but that's not a problem. All right, I'm gonna pull that off. And what do I see? Look at that. See all these air bubbles in the actual dough. It's gonna fall on my laptop again. <laughs> Here we go. All right, yeah, I've caught them, don't worry. Okay, so I now have my proofed dough. I'm gonna prepare a clean surface to be able to pop the dough on and minimally handle it so I can actually put it in the bread in mostly its proofed or risen state. So how do I do that? Don't need to knead, there's no further kneading. The rest of the rising and the actual ability to continue rising to its larger form is gonna happen in the oven in my closed chamber. So effectively, I'm going to prepare my surface with some flour and the surface is cleaned. I always, I mean, I have a wood countertop as um, a cell biologist and physiologist, I always bleach everything in my house. Uh, it's just kind of practice. You bleach things in your lab, why wouldn't you bleach things in your house, right? So this countertop is actually always bleached constantly with a mild 10% bleach solution, okay? Um, so I'm going to take that extra bit of um, white flour that I had available, um, sitting on the side, lay it down on my countertop, and I'm literally just kind of going to smooth it out. It is a wood surface, so I don't want it, my dough when I topple it over to stick to the wood. So effectively, I'm just going to make sure it's kind of a smooth layer of my flour. Then I'm going to take my dough and I'm literally going to scrape it out 
with that mixing spoon. Then I'm going to raise this a little bit so you can see it a bit more. There we go. Right onto that flour. Mm, just grab everything. There's fancy scrapers you can buy, but let's be real. I mean, a spoon can do the job for you just as well. Or even your bare hands. There's something to, to say to have like the ability to handle your actual bread and handle the just feel the, the consistency of the dough. That's what any like good French baker will tell you. I'm not French and I'm not a baker, but this works. So effectively, here we go. I'm gonna handle it minimally. I'm gonna fold it in four times. So I've already folded it in once. I'm gonna fold it in another time, a third time, and finally my fourth time. So you're kind of just like wrapping a little present in there. Then I'm going to grab a bigger bowl, a clean bowl, and I'm going to lay out some parchment paper to be able to have this dough sit for a little bit of time. It's kind of like a second proofing. Truly, it's not a second proofing. It's just for it to settle down in the actual bowl. So I will lightly handle it and I'm going to add some more flour. See how it's still got that nice bouncing consistency you don't want to pound it if you pound it it's going to end up like a pancake and there's nothing you can do there and you'll have to start from scratch so here we go we're going to take the dough ever so gently and lay it into my bowl this is like a big soup bowl nothing fancy with my parchment paper inside okay this is the one time that I'm actually going to let it sit on my warming oven because I want it to rise a little bit more before I pop it in the oven. So this is gonna be a little bit of a warmer environment. The dough is gonna be super happy. It's gonna be really rising a little bit. And then just before I'm ready to pop it in, I'm gonna make my cuts with my kitchen scissor, okay? All right, so just like any good cook, more in our case any good scientist we clean up our bench space as we go so cleaning up our bench space don't leave a mess behind that's just kind of not nice for any lab mates so cleaning up after ourselves I also tend to lean on my benches all the time so it's just good practice so I'm gonna quickly rinse my hands I've got my cloth with bleach ready wipe that down also because I dropped a whole bunch of yeast just a couple of minutes ago <laughs> in this area. All right. Okay. So I'm going to pretend that that's been sitting there for a little bit of time. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm ready. The dough has risen. It hasn't very much, but it's okay. I like the way it looks. It's got this really nice, um, don't like appearance it's sitting in the parchment I'm going to now take and make uh, whatever pattern I like I'm a scientist I'm not an artist full disclosure so I go with the typical plus sign or X shape um, some people get really creative some people like actually use a lom or even like a razor not a razor blade like the true razor blades like a single blade and cut patterns into it I kind of am like, man, the faster I can get the bread into the oven, the faster I'm going to eat it. So <laughs> I will take literally my scissors and cut that shape that uh, is just going to allow for some structure to actually allow further uh, structure in the bread. Why do you need to cut? I know everyone's like, no, not the bread. <laughs> you guys are funny. Uh, why do we need to cut? You're going to have, as the bread is... Uh, growing a little bit more in the oven, you're gonna have steam being produced. You wanna have directed areas where the steam is actually gonna leave the bread. And that's the main reason why we cut the surface of bread. So we have vent ports where you actually have that steam exiting, okay? So effectively, I'm gonna take my scissors and literally just make big cuts and just be like open and cut, open and cut, and cut, and cut. This is your first dissection class in undergrad. So there we go. That is my basic cutting pattern. It's as 
complex as it's gonna get because I'm not an artist. If I wanted to add like maybe a few more cuts here or there, sure, why not? Now here's the part that you need to be very careful. The bread is ready to go into the oven. You're gonna handle now a pot that's been sitting in your oven at 450 for probably a half hour in advance. That's what you wanna do. You wanna warm your pots when you start your oven. Most conventional ovens in our homes need about a half hour to warm up. So while that bread is, is rising, you would set the oven at a half hour in advance of when it needs to go in the oven. And effectively, you're gonna be able to, at the same time, put your pot in to warm up. My pot is in there. So you can see there is my pot. If anyone has ever been burnt by a cast iron pot, it's painful as nobody's business. I mean, anything hot just hurts. So I'm gonna handle this with utmost care. I don't have my lab gloves, but I've got to protect my surface, um, my heat pads, and I'm gonna have some really thick cloths to handle the handles of my pot, just to make sure that I'm not careful, um, or that I'm careful, <laughs> I'm not careful, just to make sure that I'm careful <laughs> when handling the pot, okay? So I'm gonna basically come this way, try not, try not to burn the microphone that's kind of strapped onto me. Okay, and here we go. Here is my pot. It is empty. So I'm gonna open it up. This is very, very, very hot. And there we go. I'm literally gonna lay down the lid on the oven so I don't accidentally burn myself. And all I need to do is put our little bread into this pot. So I'm gonna move this closer so I don't burn myself inadvertently. And here we go. Parchment paper and all. You lift the parchment paper and ever so gently. This is the most delicate lab procedure ever. <laughs> it's not burning yourself while putting something into a empty bare um, pot or vessel that you're gonna make your bread in. So effectively you grab your parchment paper, lift and drop. And here we go. And you can see that we end up having now the bread with the parchment paper in the pot, ready to go into the oven. So I'm gonna very carefully, some days you can get distracted and just gr try to grab the handle without actually having any type of cloth or oven mitts. Please, please, please. This is the most important thing to be careful about. Handle your um, products that are in the oven with care and don't burn yourselves. So I'm gonna add it back, put my pot with my bread, in the oven, close the door. I just took off my microphone. This is what happens when I get excited in class. It happens all the time. And now, what we're gonna do, is we're gonna set the universal timer of everyone probably on this chat. I'm gonna take out my cell phone, and I'm going to basically open up my timer and set it for 30 minutes. You can see I bake bread all the time. It's always on 30 minutes. <laughs> so press start. And there we go. The countdown begins. Okay? And that's it. It's funny. Someone said right there in the chat, time of death, 3 o'clock. Not quite. Time of death will probably be 3.30 <laughs> for all the yeast within. You can see how hot this particular pot is. I literally just laid it down on my cork pad and you can see it incinerated part of the pad. So please be careful with any hot pots on any surfaces. Make sure you're using your pads. Okay, that is it. The bread is in the oven. So are we gonna wait for a half hour? No, I wouldn't be like a really good person and a good host for you if I didn't have a bread ready for you to see the outcome. So basically, we're gonna talk about what's happening in there before I show you the outcome. In the oven, things start slowing down for the yeast. The yeast is gonna slowly start, start, start to die. But at the same time, all of those really nice air bubble or CO2 bubbles that have formed inside the elastic uh, meshwork of the gluten fibers in the bread are gonna start to slowly start solidifying as really nice little air pockets. So effectively, you're gonna have a little bit of a rising in the initial stages and ultimately a setting of the bread in its final height and in its final structure. So what goes on to be able to allow for the bread to get its crust? So this is something that is called a Maillard reaction. And why do we call it Maillard? 
Well, because this scientist, this chemist by the name of Louis Maillard, discovered that uh, there's a reaction that occurs when you end combine um, proteins and sugars uh, with high heat, generally in and around 150 to 180 degrees Celsius or 280 to 330 degrees Fahrenheit. And when that reaction occurs, you end up having um, pigments that start forming called melanoidins. And these melanoidins give the color to your bread. If you uh, leave the bread in the oven for too long, you start producing other byproducts and that's the burn of bread. Or just like anything else, if you ever burnt toast, that's your Maillard reaction gone wrong. That's where like chemistry has done you wrong yet again. It wasn't the biology, it was the chemistry of the reaction. And then finally, you also have, as your bread is in the oven, a really nice aroma that starts permeating the house. You know, this is kind of the, the wake up call of the morning when bread's baking and you can smell it. And that's usually the outcome of the Maillard reaction where you have these proteins and sugar molecules being able to start reacting with each other and starting to be able to release these other organic aromatic compounds that give you that smell of bread. If we consider why we end up getting the crust the way that it is, it's because we're building up steam in that vessel. And effectively, what ends up happening is that steam stays in the bread, retaining its moisture, while at the same time, we have the ability to have the Maillard reaction cause this really nice crystallization and really almost gel-like transformation of sugars on the surface of the bread, producing a bubbling-like reaction and eventually the crust of the bread. It's a beautiful thing, okay? So effectively, I want to show you the outcome of what you could potentially get if you follow this recipe. So I've got a perfectly cooled um, additional closed vessel. This is a, a type of vessel that I use sometimes when I'm making many other breads. I don't have like multiple um, uh, cast iron pots. That's just kind of something that's in surplus in a kitchen. But what I do have is cultural fare. So let me show you. This is a traditional Portuguese clay pot. I'm Portuguese by uh, heritage, Portuguese Canadian. Um, my parents are immigrants in this country. I'm a Gen 1 student, so I was the first university student uh, in my family, the first child in my family to go to university. And one thing that we kind of held on to always is just our culture and our background. Um, so we have these pots in our kitchen, like all the time. We make things with them. We make fish with them. We make uh, potato casserole. We make everything with these types of pots. And this is one of my favorites. I'm handling it because it's cool. It's been out of the oven for a number of hours now. Um, it's kind of like a cast iron pot, but it's with clay. And this was one particular um, bread that I made just a few hours ago. It was made in this pot and you can see the outcome. Look at that. It's not a cast iron pot. Remember I said, all you need is a specific type of a closed vessel to make this no need bread in a very nice, and enclosed and steam filled and rich environment. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? It is a fabulous type of bread. So I would do you wrong if I didn't cut this puppy open. So I'm going to cut this puppy open, get my bread knife. You don't need a bread knife. You can use a steak knife. Just don't use a butter knife. Butter knives are not going to do anything but mush your bread. So I'm going to take my good old bread knife. I can use a steak knife if I wanted. I'm going to get my cutting board. All right, here's the last dissection for today. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna straight cut into the middle. I would never do this. Like if I was serving family, I wouldn't be like half for me and the rest for you. I would probably start at one end and start slicing bread and that's usually what we do. Or all for me, right? <laughs> so effectively, I just wanna show you what the cross section of this dissection of this bread will look like. So if I cut it down, you can see my cross shape, my plus plus sign or X shape, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to cut into it. That sound is like amazing. You can hear the crust, crunchy, crunchy, crunchy. Let's see how it looks. I'm so excited. And look at that. How awesome is that? And then of course, what I would do at this point, I tend to not wait till the bread cools. I kind of just like grab the butter and I'm like, mmm, not the whole thing. But you know, take a slice, see how it tastes, serve it up for the family. It is a family favorite. It's something my mom waits for. 
every weekend and actually doesn't allow me to walk into her house without a loaf of bread. So hi mom, I'll bring you some bread. Three loaves coming. <laughs> so it is family bread. Um, who taught me how to make bread? My mom. She's the true baker in the family. I just needed a pastime during quarantine. And uh, this was it during the lockdown period of COVID. It's been a super challenging time for all of us, but I think the most important thing is we got to spend time with families. If we have good health, mental well-being, emotional well-being, and more importantly, be able to keep busy and stay positive. Pandemics of civilization past have shown us that we have the ability to be resilient as humans, be kind to each other, and be able to be able to pass any type of challenge that comes our way. And of course, a little bit of bread is always going to help. So that's it from me. Um, like I said, I look forward to being able to have you maybe join me in the future. For a future cooking with Dr. D. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I encourage you to try this recipe yourself. Try to be able to consider, um, well, I'm sharing the recipe right now. You don't have to uh, have any type of notes taking, uh, note taking going on right now. This uh, will be posted and shared in advance. But just a quick recap, three cups of all-purpose flour, four heaping tablespoons of whole wheat flour, one teaspoon of salt, three quarters teaspoon of yeast, two cups of water and maybe some more just to reach that sticky consistency and then follow the ingredients and you're good to go. One small note, you may just want to make white bread. You may not want the whole wheat flavor and that's totally fine. Just adjust the amount of water that you add and you're good to go. So I would love for you to share with me any of your cooking adventures or baking adventures. I've got my handles there for Twitter and for the gram, Instagram. Um, if you're interested in any of our biology courses or programming here at McMaster, please feel free to reach out to me or my amazing colleague in my department, Ms. Tanya Borisovich, and we're happy to answer any questions at any time. So thanks once again. Thanks everyone for showing up and thank you MSS.